So everyone, welcome to um, the uh, March uh, to 2021 Underwater HOA meeting. Uh, for those of you who are new, this meeting uh, is happening online as opposed to the way our chair convened it uh, one year ago uh, today uh, or this month at Pinecrest Gardens. That was our very last in-person meeting. Uh, at the Hibiscus Gallery. And it was a very hopeful meeting. We had uh, Adam and Jamal plant all sorts of interactive activities. Uh, there were people literally hand painting their underwater HOA signs. And um, 13, 14 days later, everyone was quarantined and we're still here. So what a difference a year has made. The same um, kind of difference, but in a more dramatic way, um, I am sure uh, has been felt by uh, the melting um, Arctic. I know that uh, I was there in 2008 as part of a national, a New York Foundation for the Arts art project, and it took my icebreaker literally five days to get from um, Murmansk, uh, you know, a Russian city where uh, the icebreaker left, all the way to the North Pole, which was absolutely ridiculous, stupid record time. And the uh, people who uh, manned uh, the ship uh, stated it's probably because the ice is a whole lot thinner than it's ever been before, before the dozens and dozens of times that they had taken that same route. So we are in a changing planet. And today, the New York Times uh, reported, reported what we've been talking about for a very long time. I have a, a sister project uh, called 90N that uh, talked about the North Pole and its melting and the consequences of that melting and the impact of a melting Greenland on our Gulf Stream can have catastrophic effects, uh, not just across uh, the continent of Africa, but also uh, in Europe and in the United States as our Gulf, our, um, our, um, jet, our, our Gulf Stream uh, weakens. And of course our jet stream weakens and things like the catastrophe of Texas, again, can be, um, attributed to that changing wobbling um, jet stream and to our weakening Gulf Stream, we can um, bring attention to the fact that stronger, uh, unpredictable, wetter, slower hurricanes will be uh, hitting the southeastern United States. So what, what I'm trying to say is that um, at a moment when the Miami mayor is uh, excited, and I share his excitement about bringing Silicon Valley to Miami and calling it something other than Silicon Valley, right? The new tech revolution that we're bringing. And at the moment where the Miami real estate market is exploding, hot, impossible for anyone to afford a home, just crazy, out of control, hot. I want this underwater homeowners movement to understand that the future is not as bright as the real estate market looks, that there are different timelines uh, and that those timelines impact tax bases and property values. And there's an Army Corps of Engineers planning to do stuff at the northern part of the bay, but ignoring the southern part of the bay. There are climate um, gentrification, I'll call it climate migration situations happening within Miami-Dade County that are only gonna be exacerbated as um, we choose winners and losers in future uh, neighborhoods. And Esber, I wanted to allude to that when you're talking about the sea level rise report, what's gonna happen to uh, low income, high elevation, and by high, I mean, you know, 20 feet above sea level, <laughs> but low income, high elevation um, communities uh, that uh, will lose the very fabric of their community as uh, we plan for a future with rising seas. And I'm telling you all this, you know, uh, because I think now more than ever, we have a Senate that I think will listen to us. We have a House of Representatives in Congress that will listen to us. And clearly we have a president and, um, and John Kerry who are really gonna fight for climate. But I don't want us here in South Florida to get lost in a euphoria and not hold uh, the governor and the state legislature accountable. 
and not hold our county commissioners accountable because our future collectively as citizens of Miami depends on how we respond to this moment. And if we're stuck in imagining a future that has all sorts of growth, because Miami is now uh, a destination city. It is a growth city. More people are moving to Miami. A city that should be talking about climate migration is doing the exact opposite. So I just, I just want us not to be naysayers, right? But to be truth speakers. And I know that I'm working again with the team. I'm working with Adam who, who works full time for me in, in, in my studio, in the studio that's hosting the Underwater HOA on developing new processes and new ways of helping us understand that. Not as a way of, of, of raining on someone's parade, but on keeping it real. And that's why we continue meeting in this Underwater Homeowners Association. And my hope is that with every single meeting, there's uh, inspiration in each of you that your curiosity is peaked. And clearly with speakers like the one we have today, on a monthly basis, you learn more. You literally become better educated, because I do. Every single one of these meetings, I come away stronger and more knowledgeable on this issue. So my hope is that what we're doing here grows capacity, creates a, a cadre of leaderships. You, you, this is the 17 people in this room who understand how consequential inaction is and who in your own way can problem solve that. That's the reason we're meeting here. Uh, and I want to remind everyone in case you're saying, oh, well, what's going on here? There is a completely 100% volunteer run effort, right? So this is not like you're talking to, you know, some group with some foundation funding. This is 100% volunteer. So please forgive anything that doesn't look polished. And like if we had a $100,000 budget, we don't even have a $5 budget. So, you know, please forgive us as we, as we um, put all this together. Okay. So anyway, with that, I just wanted to give you that because the New York Times, you know, showed that article today. And I know that um, there's a lot of folks meeting globally right now, electronically around uh, climate. Um, you know, there's this, this attention to the pandemic with all our need to, I just told you, I just got my, my vaccination. All of this is real, right? And at the same time, there's this tech industry that's coming up here. There are states that are not having masks and it's just a society that feels too self-absorbed to understand the consequences of not acting in unison and acting towards a better end goal. And through this underwater HOA, I'm trying to change that way of thinking. And I couldn't be prouder to have as a partner in all of this uh, from day one, from January of 2019, when, um, when the current mayor of Miami-Dade County, had him take the oath of office uh, as our chair. And with that, uh, Brian, I'd just like you to uh, start and run our meeting. Okay, well, great. Thank you, Xavier, for that uh, introduction and uh, share your thoughts on the, the importance of this now as it grows day by day. Just like to mention with the segue about uh, Daniela Levine Cava providing the, my, um, the oath of office, as it were, that um, the, this new sea level rise plan that the county just announced uh, last about a week, this last week, um, is something that we should all look into. I personally, unfortunately, have not had much of a chance to do that yet, but I plan on doing so. And I think we should all maybe at one point later in the one of the future meetings we can discuss maybe next time, discuss some of that, if we've all had a chance to look into that. Um, I know, Somebody that's uh, well versed in these sort of things is uh, speaking with us today, um, uh, Dr. Esper Andrew. I should have asked you, Esper, how to say your last name. Yeah, just call it Esper. Esper. <laughs> I uh, realized, that, oh no, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, no worries, Brian. I'm going to choke this on this one. But um, he's uh, somebody that I've been recently in the last, I'd say, year or two, we've started to work together more and more. And I think it's a real come to understand what an important contributor he is to the discussion at the, at the university level and, and beyond on the uh, uh, on coastal, coastal communities, sustainability issues, and in particular coastal construction. He's an associate professor at the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering, and he's also with a, an appointment in the School of Architecture and is involved in um, construction management issues and, and really trying to, uh, where the rubber meets the road in the sense of uh, 
trying to build more sustainable, resilient solutions uh, for coastal communities like Miami-Dade County. And I look forward to, uh, to hearing what he has to say. So it's all yours, Esper. Well, thank you all very much for this opportunity and the introduction. Um, it is certainly a pleasure and a privilege uh, to have the platform this evening. Um, um, can you please confirm that you can see the screen? Looks good. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Um, so, um, as Brian noted, I have been engaged in um, coastal resilience uh, focused efforts uh, from multiple perspectives. Um, so, um, you know, as a from research capacity to um, you know, then being an educator faculty in the uh, Department of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering, um, I'm fortunate enough to also have the opportunity to initiate uh, new educational uh, programs or um, pathways uh, that can contribute uh, to uh, this effort. So uh, tonight, what, uh, what I prepared is to really discuss coastal resiliency from innovations, community engagement, and education perspective, how all of that can come together uh, to really uh, deliver uh, what is needed here because um, you know, over the past few years, as we started getting more and more into this, it became so apparent that uh, we can't really handle it from just, you know, from the industry side or academia side or uh, practice. Um, and we can't handle it just through one lens from one discipline. Uh, this is an um, interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary uh, collaboration. So uh, I'm having a little trouble. My cursor is not, uh, let's see, all right. So since Xavier mentioned uh, about the sea level rise uh, solution that uh, Miami-Dade County just uh, released last Friday, as I noted before some of you joined in, I had the privilege of having uh, Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience uh, participate in my course, uh, which is Sustainable Construction, CAE uh, 660. And they came and gave an introduction uh, to my students uh, the night before uh, releasing this uh, new uh, program. Please excuse my dogs also. Um, you might hear them barking on and up. So I actually stole a, just a few slides to get us going on this. Um, you know, from the presentation that was shared uh, in my class. Um, so I kind of want to highlight some of those things. So the, you know, the mitigation, adaptation and communication uh, that is highlighted on this first slide, um, you know, is really speaks to uh, technological innovations that are necessary to uh, respond to the mitigation uh, needs. And you know the adaptation, it just really speaks to how each one of us will be affected, and how challenging this uh, the you know the decades ahead may become. And um, it is only going to be possible by all of us contributing and and um, understanding the implications and changes to our everyday lifestyle that we are accustomed to. And ultimately, you know, communicating, the engaging and connecting with the community, because as I said in the beginning, this is very much a community effort. It's a cross-disciplinary effort across, you know, all demographic groups and, you know, professions. Um, so therefore, um, you know, these are the key points there that, um, you know, the Office of Resilience have also highlighted. Um, so there are a couple things that were picked uh, from the presentation uh, to my class, 
And you can see on there the action items, action one, preserve and restore Biscayne Bay. We're all experiencing significant issues with water quality, the fish kill, uh, nutrient loading in the bay. So integrate resilience into parks and open spaces. Um, that's the best way we are looking to make this happen short of retreat. Uh, and perhaps this would be selective retreat where the retreat uh, um, areas can serve as parks or recreational zones that will contribute uh, to a bigger, uh, broader resilience of the community. And then look at what are some of the strategies um, that you know, we are looking to implement in, you know, um, as a solution, as well as um, you know, the, what are some of the ways we can strengthen the resilience planning. So um, when the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience came and gave this presentation to my class, at the end of their presentation, they tasked my students who come from interdisciplinary backgrounds. Some are Master of Science students in construction management. Some are PhD students in civil or environmental engineering. Uh, some are architectural engineering uh, graduate students and some are Master of Sustainable Business program students. So th there is a cross-disciplinary composition which adds strength to their uh, perspectives uh, when they are applying to those solutions. So at the end of the presentation, they were tasked with um, finding response to some of these challenges. So in that uh, discussion, the zone uh, was identified for my group of students also for study as the Little River and the surrounding uh, uh, communities, uh, which primarily are experiencing significant challenges today uh, due to uh, lack of uh, wastewater utility infrastructure in much of that area. So a lot of the residents are relying on septic systems, which are failing um, and not properly performing due to the saturated um, you know, um, soil conditions um, as a result of frequent flood events and rising um, sea level. Um, so uh, septic systems have been identified as a concern uh, or as contributing factors to nutrient loading in the river and ultimately uh, a few months back, you all witnessed what happened in North Bay Village with the fish kill. Um, so uh, that, you know, this is why we thought uh, let's focus in this community and Miami-Dade Water and Sewer has a significant uh, funding allocated uh, for extending um, waste water utilities to some of these regions. However, um, this is a very expensive and lengthy uh, uh, undertaking. So it's gonna take some time to get there. So in the meantime, what can we do? So the questions that my students were tasked in uh, as a result of uh, this interaction were the four questions, actually five questions that you see. And so all the students are going to be answering at least two of those uh, questions in teams of two or three students. Um, so question one basically looks at under this uh, new uh, sea level rise uh, solutions strategy by the county to uh, understand the, the, what type of structural foundations may exist in some of these communities and how feasible it might be to actually jack up and raise these structures. And what may be the financial structures, I mean, if, uh, financial resources that may uh, be required to do that, is it really possible to do it? And so depending on the type of um, foundations and the structural um, you know, construction practices that were in place at the time some of these buildings were built um, that could perhaps um, offer some uh, understanding. Um, you know, about a year or two years ago, I was engaged in a different project with City of Miami 
it was in the little Haiti community. And in that particular case, we have looked at what is happening uh, in little Haiti in the form of gentrification, where a lot of the property owners who owned uh, properties that were historically significant, um, so they were well worth uh, preserving, and they were also located on very high grounds that were not subject to flooding. However, they did not have the understanding or financial resources on how to restore them. Um, and often a lot of these folks were uh, bought out and as an alternate uh, solution, they were actually provided housing options in the area that we're just look, we were just looking at in the map, in the East uh, Biscayne uh, Boulevard corridor, right in front of Miami Shores and the Little River area, which is extremely low lying, flood prone. Um, so um, therefore, um, you know, the, what we arrive here could really contribute to solutions beyond uh, this region and other communities uh, in our area as well. So then they wanted to also understand the relative uh, feasibility, average costs um, of uh, elevating such structures and how would one pay for them. And uh, then uh, again with question three, look at innovative methods and processes uh, for uh, the future first floor elevation in the future, how to design those. And then finally uh, with question four, once we elevate these buildings or structures, whether existing or new construction, what can be done in this space that is below the structures? Uh, so can we turn that into a positive resource? Um, so uh, my students are gonna be working again on this as solutions. I, and I would be happy to uh, share the uh, webinar invite uh, when uh, they're ready for the presentation and I hope that a lot of you will be able to join us uh, during that time and you know along the way please feel free to stop me also if you prefer to uh, ask questions uh, along the way so we, this can be a casual discussion so um, now that uh, we kind of highlighted this uh, current dilemma, and I'm going to touch back on the sea level rise solutions uh, that were just re released. I want to kind of take us back to my motivation and what are the industry trends at the same time while we are facing uh, these challenges. Uh, as we all know, we are experiencing significant growth in our community so and significant in construction sector specifically. So in 2020, um, you see that 1.5 billion was the total national spending in the construction sector. And that number is projected to be 17 and a half trillion globally by 2030. So that is a really significant you know, impact there. But so the construction sector is not going anywhere. And um, given that, how can we build better? How can we uh, implement more innovative practices into construction? Um, and it is really important that we start coming up with alternative materials that are more sustainable, more resilient. This is quite a bit of investment that's gonna go in, uh, into construction sector and growth globally. So we should really uh, think hard on how we approach it. Um, so um, building sector and in construction as a result also is going to be facing significant workforce shortages. We're already seeing some of that uh, you know, uh, happening. And um, some of that is also due to the type of training that may be currently in place um, or traditionally uh, delivered, uh, starting from lower school all the way to advanced degrees, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in college or and somewhere in between there, the vocational trades. Um, so there needs to be, um, 
some opportunities created where we can make some difference and improve in those areas. So the areas that are also identified as in need areas is energy, water, and coastal infrastructure. And we are experiencing a lot of those firsthand in our um, you know, communities here. So um, what can we anticipate out of all this? Um, so one thing, as you know, I already mentioned, it's quite obvious that we're going to have to tackle this with cross-disciplinary collaborations, talking across various platforms uh, and, and expertise areas. Um, so there's going to be needs that are um, coming to uh, that will require changes in design and construction practices. And some of that is going to be the result of the technological advancements that are emerging. And others are going to be the outcome of like what we just talked about, for example, the sea level rights solution that our governing agencies are, are proposing and they're gonna put into legislation for and make it part of codes. Um, so impact on energy and water resources in infrastructure infrastructure is going to be really significant and uh, and they're going to have significant environmental economic impacts uh, that are going to need to be uh, considered. So how can we respond to those and reduce that burden? So workforce shortages in especially the green market sector uh, is, is going to be the key also and increase awareness and participation uh, by the communities. So how can we engage them in, in this discussion? So, sorry. Um, so uh, what is um, from the academia's uh, perspective uh, as an academic institution, what is our role and response to that? So one uh, from one is technological innovations, applied research projects that um, we can bring to light and uh, in partnership with industry leaders and governing agencies, and then work on adaptation of these new technologies into codes and uh, practices. Um, and, you know, how are we going to get that done is through, you know, educational initiatives that are ranging anywhere from, you know, at a multi-tier level. Uh, if you look at uh, that first image there, uh, that's what I mean that, um, you know, we really need to reach to every demographic group, every age group in our community to get them engaged. So that means that, you know, one thing we found, for example, when I was working on that little Haiti community project, that most of the adults, that were in that community did not speak English or were not really able to read. So often they relied on their children. Some of these kids were, you know, middle school, lower school, high school age kids, and they became the messengers, you know, from what they learned and how they relayed that message at home to their parents. So the, that multi-tier delivery and, and how we can reach, uh, you know, in education, whether it's through webinars, lunch and learns, uh, single courses that are right on target that respond to these need areas, uh, certificate programs, to uh, new degree programs, which, you know, uh, the one that I mentioned, for example, our Master of Science in Construction Management program is exactly intended, was developed with that intent um, to capture uh, these opportunities and, um, you know, help us get through, uh, make that community engagement component a little easier. Um, so today, you know, we are quite busy with some of those initiatives. We do hold on-campus um, sessions during the summer as well as throughout the year really with uh, in partnership with uh, Miami-Dade County where we bring young students, get them exposed to hands-on um, uh, research project experiments, um, get them exposed on STEM education. Uh, so therefore, you know, that's our focus. That's the attempt. 
Um, so how do we do that though in an academic uh, program setting, for example, in my program, the Master of Science in Construction Management? I always tell people that uh, the construction management program that we offer at College of Engineering is really significantly different than traditional construction management programs offered um, in general, because we specifically look for innovative solutions. So uh, it is my task really to reach out to all my colleagues and gather information about various ongoing research projects that they may be engaged in and find applied uh, solutions out of those projects. Um, it is very frustrating um, to be in a, you know, in an academic setting in a research institution and seeing great um, resources and a lot of innovative research projects with uh, significant knowledge in, uh, being disseminated out of them, but yet some of the outcomes are just staying in someone's lab or sitting on the shelf once the project life is completed. Uh, so I started collecting them and finding applied solutions and then integrating them into the construction management uh, program curriculum as uh, a way to empower those students who will be graduating and moving into workforce so that they can you know, lead the way with uh, some of these efforts. So um, one of the other initiatives we came up in that setting, as I noted in the beginning, for example, the, the workforce need in the um, uh, you know, green market, uh, green professionals is um, you know, this green uh, professional building skill training G Pro certificate program, which we develop in partnership with Urban Green Council of New York, Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience, and Division of Continuing and International Education for uh, either our students on campus or anyone in the community um, who is not even a college student could enroll and get that training. And that particular program is one example, again, on the education side that specifically focuses on energy, water use, and waste reduction. So how are we uh, going to approach this now from kind of bring it all together? So as I kind of mentioned now that I search for projects and integrate them into the CM program curriculum. Uh, the same approach really is uh, the way uh, my thinking is in our community. So identify a problem in a given community, uh, team up with research and development uh, groups uh, from academic institutions and um, or industry sector and carry that over that research and development application into a practical application. Uh, once documenting it, then look to see what type of policy adaptations or improvements it may require. Start educating uh, the community. So I say students there, but you know, who are the students? All of us and all the stakeholders in the community. And um, so, and then from there, look, you know, ultimately, um, what would be the rewarding outcome for those of us on the research and development side is the technology transfer, actually seeing that the, um, the research outcome uh, ends up in technology transfer. And uh, I feel that going through that cycle is what's going to generate that uh, resilience outreach in the community and start making a difference uh, for us in the community. So uh, based uh, with that kind of a background, I kind of want to share with you a few um, of those type investigations. So examples of it, in other words, that uh, all of these are uh, initiatives, again, sponsored under our Master of Science in Construction Management program. So nutrient recovery septic system retrofit. So this is actually a project uh, uh, that I'm uh, working on together with 
one of my other colleagues, Dr. James Inglehart, who is leading this effort. Um, it um, came to us during um, the presentation and discussions with a PhD student whom I was one of his committee members. Um, so his work was uh, looking at recovering nutrients, phosphates and nitrates out of wastewater stream. And he was able to demonstrate that in a lab setting. So after seeing that, we said, you know, look at all the nutrient loading issues we're experiencing in Skane Bay. So uh, all those failing septic systems. So why can't we adapt this innovation as a solution uh, for the septic systems? Uh, can that be an option to sewer main extensions? Um, so uh, we got in treat. And soon enough, we had an industry partner who got really excited about it. Uh, EPRI, uh, Energy Power Research Institute, also funded the project. And now uh, we are in the process of assembling it as a five foot by five foot by five foot or six foot tall, roughly, uh, box that is going to be installed in a backyard and uh, as a pilot project. And Durham, Miami-Dade Town of Durham is very much uh, engaged and in, excited about this. And so it is going into a um, Durham employee's private home and in Palmetto Bay. And uh, we will be testing that pilot project there. So uh, once it is tested, documented as a pilot project, why not uh, bring it in as a solution in the Little River community, for example? So that's what we're looking at. So a number of years ago, the same uh, colleague also had the Net Zero Water Project um, uh, on campus. It ran for eight years. It was demonstrated. Uh, again, policies were not in place. We weren't really ready to adapt it. Uh, so um, it is still available in there. And since uh, that time, um, you know, it has evolved and improved even further. So it can be 100% water energy recyclable and it's energy positive. Energy positive in a sense, meaning that wastewater uh, leaving a home, actually we found that it retains 4% of the hot water heating energy. So therefore that can be recovered. So again, that's an example of innovative approaches uh, brought in for resilience uh, solution. The uh, next one is on the more energy sector. This is, again, this is something I'm more passionate about because it was virtual flow meter development is my project um, directly. Um, so it is measuring flow in air and water streams um, without a physical flow meter, simply by collecting retrieving data from power input uh, to equipment and simply getting pressure at the discharge point of the flow stream. Um, and we are able to, with an algorithm, uh, determine uh, air or water flow rates up to 99% at, at, uh, um, accuracy. So we once we developed this, initially we started looking at it, where can we implement it? So the first stop was uh, HVAC sector, uh, fans, chillers, pumps, and physical flow meters are essential for energy metering and, and you know, uh, balancing systems, but they're extremely expensive. So they're not really practical to implement. Uh, so this enabled us to do that. And along the way, we also found uh, that it was extremely useful for fault detection and uh, improved energy efficiency. So beyond hydronic HVAC systems, then we started looking at what could be some other um, applications for this. So wastewater pump stations uh, came to mind. And really the way that happened is about two, three years ago, I was at a um, water wastewater utility conference and um, during uh, the event, there were a number of very large uh, wastewater uh, utility departments there, Washington DC, Gwinnett County, Georgia, of course, Miami-Dade County. And in the discussions, the question came up about energy efficiency of wastewater 
uh, treatment plants and pump stations. And you know, pump stations are uh, quite significant in our region because we are on a totally flat uh, topography. So we rely on uh, pumps uh, for conveying wastewater. We can't rely on gravity. And the response we got from all the utilities was energy efficiency of wastewater pump stations and treatment plants is kind of about the fourth in priority on our agenda because our first priority is reliable delivery of water wastewater utilities. So, you know, we got to thinking that what can we do in that sector? So we introduced the virtual flow meter for optimizing uh, wastewater pump station efficiency. So today we have uh, that as a pilot project, currently active pilot project in pump station number 26 in Doral um, that is ongoing. Um, so Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience's BE305 initiative um, that is part of the Resilient 305 um, uh, initiative um, is going to be also be benefiting significantly on when it comes to energy management and metering, um, you know, from this innovation. We actually are currently hoping to uh, deploy an experimental project in the Gables One Tower in Coral Gables in one of our campus buildings in collaborations with the university uh, facilities department. So, um, oops, sorry, um, the few other uh, on uh, shoreline protection systems and materials uh, options. So uh, that what are the emerging innovations? So secrete seawater concrete is something we found uh, that came out of our CAE department. Uh, fiber polymer reinforcement has been in place for quite some time now, but has not really been put into as frequent application as a non-corrosive uh, uh, reinforcement alternative in um, structures, especially in coastal structures, which experience uh, significant corrosion um, and, um, due to the saltwater intrusion. And, and you know, the, Something I'm proud of, and I, I know a few of my colleagues, Brian uh, Landoff Barbarigos and uh, Pranoy Surinani, uh, are here tonight. The modular sea hive, um, you know, elements again that are um, solutions uh, introduced, and why not <clears throat> make use of them as applicable solutions? So. Um, this is kind of a quick handful of innovations that are available to us. Why can't we start making them as tools, using them as tools for resilient solutions? Um, so uh, moving on, uh, I'll move on to my other project that I'm passionately engaged in that kind of feeds along the same uh, topics, the next generation of coastal structures, um, and that really will draw from some of these innovations and integrate some of those into the next generation coastal st structure solutions, hopefully. So our motivation for that was obviously what we started talking about with uh, this evening with the sea level rise and uh, you know, the challenges described even by Miami-Dade County recently, again. Um, so uh, I keep re referencing that interdisciplinary approach. So uh, of course, naturally that interdisciplinary research team was uh, the essential element uh, to respond to this question. Uh, so a team of us assembled, uh, again, some of my colleagues who are on here tonight are part of that team. And then, um, you know, we wanted to understand the coastal structures, uh, what are the roles that they perform and what are the lessons we can learn from them so that we can improve um, when we are talking about the next generation. So our, again, the approach uh, for this has been a three phase approach. So, so far we have completed phase one. We are kind of towards the end of phase two right now. And then we're, hoping to continue beyond that. So um, during that process, we started by documenting site-specific variables and criteria for functionality of existing coastal structures. 
uh, engage policy and regulatory frameworks in discussion so that we could understand what are some of the challenges from the uh, policy side um, when we are coming up with these next generation structures. Uh, develop an assessment tool for use uh, globally and then implement and come up with the next generation of coastal structures uh, as design solutions. So we felt that, again, what better way of doing this than by engaging community and doing it in context of a site, just like my class is doing with the Little River or the, you know, so in, in this case, we teamed up with North Bay Village, which is surrounded by um, Biscayne Bay and experiencing all of the challenges um, that, you know, uh, we've been talking about from water quality to flood events, to insurability, to loss of property values. So, um, you know, uh, during that process, we, you know, we have been tasked to start discussing um, you know, the, what are some of the innovative forward thinking approaches? So uh, we came up, for example, the little shape we see, you see up on top, we called it a sponge wall. Uh, our thinking there was that um, we were gonna, oops, sorry, uh, we were gonna be 3D printing walls down the road perhaps. So why not um, uh, promote biodiversity with that structure? Um, we wanted to see the impact of uh, this work and challenges, ongoing challenges on property values uh, and how may that become uh, a, a useful uh, data for property owners when it comes to arriving at creative financing or funding sources for um, some of the projects that are gonna have to be undertaken. And we also wanted to come up with better materials. So my colleague that is in the audience, Dr. Pranoy Srinani, who is a cementitious material expert, uh, along with one of uh, our other colleagues, Kat Kathleen sullivan Seely from uh, Marine Biology, uh, have been looking at uh, developing what we define as biophilic cement, which could be more environmentally friendly or ecologically supportive uh, of mar marine biodiversity in the Bay. So um, that's um, it's still an ongoing project. So, so far the outcome from that project, again, uh, was this documenting as site-specific variable. So we kind of uh, toured uh, the Southeastern coastline of um, South Florida, uh, about eight zones and documented existing uh, coastal structures. What were their conditions? What were the shorelines uh, look like? And um, how could we improve them? And how did they look like they per perform? Um, so our criteria for that, um, it's like a little messed up here. Uh, for concept map for, uh, sorry, uh, assessment was, um, you know, type of structure, uh, past repairs and improvements that went into them, uh, how frequently they experienced storm events and how they uh, fared, uh, age of the structures, and, um, and then, um, you know, what were some of the related functionality. And, you know, so we define the functionality as community stakeholder functionality, engineering fun functionality, and ecological functionality. How did they serve in uh, those functionality areas? So uh, based on those outcomes, our hopes are that now, um, you know, we're going to be implementing them into uh, the future design considerations uh, moving forward. So um, we actually went back and uh, recently put out a publication uh, that came uh, from that investigation that kind of summarized uh, and developed a scoring system. So you kind of see an example of that. Uh, we would be happy to share the paper with you uh, that looked at each this, uh, zone, what was the type of uh, the description of the uh, coastal uh, system that was in place there and how did they fare or rank in uh, the context of ecological engineering and the stakeholder functionality. And they all have a score. So 
we have a lot more details, the scoring system that actually speaks to each of those functionality areas. So we want to start using those now moving forward in different um, investigations in um, As per can, can, so, uh, if we can interrupt. Um, so I saw that um, unobstructed views was a factor in the last slide. Yes. And that, of course, is the, I think that's the tail wagging the dog. Obviously, the stakeholder cares a lot about their coastal view. But when we're looking at resilience of a community, um, you know, I don't know if the, how much value was given to that in, in the score. The slide. Yeah, before. there is. There is significant value we are giving to uh, uh, views. And that's why the solutions that we're looking to develop will respond to that question specifically. Uh, so what I'm saying is if, if desperate times call for desperate measures, a view is not, like if we need to prioritize and score, clearly uh, we're looking at biomimicry, but biology wins, trumps, right? Like uh, having an actual wetland, having mangroves, having living structures, living shorelines, would trump um, anything we, I don't know if, about anything, but I know there's costs associated by, you know, uh, you know the, the amount of buffer you need from the coastal edge to the community. But what I'm yes. saying is if, if we value, like if, if we evaluate, uh, if, we, if we give the um, uh, val if we give unobstructed views of value that is disproportionate with the actual consequences of having or not having a view versus having a storm surge uh, strumming through, I, I just would love a different coefficient for, you know, the stakeholders perspective on what a coastal view is versus what protecting the structures or the storm surge are. And, and I'm just and wondering I, in that calculus, I just, I was just yeah, bugged yeah, that I saw this, so this, many this, unobstructed this, views as the issue. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is a very valid po point, Xavier, and we are definitely looking at this. And in fact, uh, one of the next steps uh, that we're going to be doing is uh, putting out a survey. And in that survey, we hope to get a more of a community-based response to what you just asked, for example. Yeah. And so that um, the buy-in for that significance will also become uh, much easier um, to understand or conceptualize once uh, we see uh, significant feedback from the community. So um, the survey that we're gonna be putting together, we haven't fully developed it yet, we're working on it, but one uh, thing, you know, there's a great point you brought up. So that uh, the valuation of the scores, the weight of the scores perhaps should be part of the survey um, to, to bring a little bit more insight to what you just uh, commented on, very much so. And uh, in, in doing this uh, activities, again, we are doing this in context of a particular, you know, North Bay Village as a typical site example, and hopefully whatever we gather from those sites, we can then, uh, you know, extend to uh, other sites beyond North Bay Village. Um, so the, we specifically targeted some sites like the, uh, the purple uh, boxes that you see. Uh, the one up on the upper right corner there is a commercial strip. So naturally the treatment uh, that a commercial parcel can afford uh, both from financial uh, perspective as well as the land development and zoning perspective is gonna be different than let's say a residential parcel. So, um, and given that that particular zone is a commercial parcel, we're also looking at what can we do there with, uh, in a way like in parallel with what you're describing, um, like a green gray infrastructure solution in front of it. And North Bay Village, in fact, right in that area, they're currently, um, working on designating that area as a uh, no motors boat zone as a marine preserve zone. Uh, so with a marine preserve zone in place, 
Uh, the hope there is that there is going to be more green gray infrastructure solutions implemented ranging from uh, baywalk and uh, mangrove plantations or seagrass beds, um, all you know, buffer as a buffer zone between that commercial strip and, and um, the bay. So with that, uh, North Bay Village, for example, is very actively also looking at what type of zoning adaptations, code adaptations they may need to implement. So they are very diligently working on that and coming up with different initiatives and presenting it to commission. Um, so, uh, you know, th that's why it's, it's very exciting to work with them there. So the other sections, the bottom sections that you see there in the North Bay Village, both in Treasure Island and Harbor Island are primarily single family residential zones. And um, they are unique in a sense because each home has a varying condition ranging from seawalls that are falling in the water to seawalls that are fairly new and built uh, to a higher elevation to seawalls that are not so bad condition, but uh, they're not tall enough. Um, and, and then you see neighbors with no defenses, with a neighbor directly next to them with a significant new defense system. So how can we address that area? So that's what we're gonna be looking at. And then the last parcel up on the upper left side is kind of speaks to what you mentioned, Xavier, that uh, it's a park uh, green area. And it is also adjacent to additional uh, vacant parcel. So we are looking to see what can be done with the green areas in the form of parks and recreation uh, type of uh, you know, use, but yet also serving um, as a solution for coastal resilience. Um, so I know I, I saw Ida Curtis, for example, uh, in the audience, I am, she is engaged with her team in the Jose Marti Park. And I know we had some discussions about the Morningside Park as well, um, that may be in the planning stage. So those are the sites that could uh, be, you know, similar uh, applications to what we're exemplifying in North Bay Village. So some of our early investigations on the types of wall systems were um, uh, looking at, um, you know, this multifunctional as solutions like the sponge wall I mentioned, for example, the whole purpose of that sponge wall was, uh, you know, promoting biodiversity on the uh, bay side uh, by uh, creating uh, 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 more ecologically conducive environment uh, with the, the sponge-like structure. And then the similar thinking on the land side was to trap nutrients or pollutants from uh, stormwater runoff uh, from falling into the bay. Uh, you know, gradually we started uh, translating some of that to Buildable solutions today, uh, sponge walls, for example, maybe somewhat 15, 20 years down the road, perhaps, uh, still at a very fundamental research investigation level. Uh, so we came up with other options, for example, creating uh, planting beds uh, on the right along the bay side again for trapping or stormwater management uh, practices, uh, using uh, innovative filtration media in the planting beds for again, um, pollution as a pollution prevention um, uh, practice. Um, so this example, what I talked about, the Baywalk giving access uh, to residents and views to water, but integrating that wetlands, floating wetlands along the coastline as part of the coastal defense system is uh, part of that those type solution strategies that we are considering there. So moving further from that, we are now moving into a little bit more detailed investigations on uh, some other new concepts where what you're seeing uh, there is a multi-tiered wall systems, like the first layer of seawall being permeable, but serving as a uh, wave, uh, break uh, element in that capacity. 
um, in between, you know, ahead of the solid seawall. And then in between the perforated seawall and the solid seawall, uh, having uh, that uh, green infrastructure where uh, mangrove plantations or seagrass beds could be, uh, you know, installed. And the finished surfaces, uh, you know, again, my colleague Pranoy Sernani could jump in at any time and mention this, uh, you know, is finding that uh, surface texture and uh, roughness is, contributes significantly to the biophilic nature and, and that, that biodiversity or, or marine, um, you know, environment, uh, the growth on the surfaces. Um, so therefore, that's what we are uh, exemplifying there, textured concrete uh, rather than solid uh, finishes. And then, um, you know, concrete members made with non-corrosive uh, fiber polymer rebar and by, you know, and using biophilic uh, concrete mix cement is uh, the thinking in there. So this is what, you know, like in, in a coastal defense system, again, um, uh, Xavier, as you mentioned, those that extended wetland application could give us the opportunity for this. So of course, what is our challenge in this on the policy side? Right now, we are restricted by only about 24 inches extension from the land, from the existing seawall location into the bay. Um, but uh, so this will obviously require some uh, policy adaptations and changes. Um, so in more of a uh, response also to what the Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience Sea Level Rise Solutions just uh, predicted or, or came out uh, re, you know, as a solution when they said build like the keys as the solution. And this is something my students in my sustainable construction course is gonna be undertaking. So this is what you know, we're talking again that elevating the buildings, but bringing some of these elements that we just discussed in the previous slide there. And, and um, you know, how can we bring that into um, you know, practice and um, then the, remember one of the questions that was uh, raised by Miami-Dade County Office of Resilience is what happens to the space under this elevated space, that cavity space? So um, there are several opportunities for that from stormwater management strategies uh, as a holding place to other innovative uh, self-contained package systems that you're gonna get to hear from my students uh, later on, uh, if you join us uh, this semester, so I'll, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, save some of that for later uh, at that point. Um, so at the same time, we also started thinking, you know, this is cost is a huge issue. Uh, we all recognize that and a lot of folks are really troubled and alarmed by that because they really don't know how to um, arrive at a solution. And in fact, when uh, Miami-Dade County came and presented some of these initiatives to my students, one of the questions my students asked was, who is paying for this? How do we do this? And, you know, uh, do you know what the response was? You know, we hope that you're gonna come up with some creative solutions. Your bright young um, students, you're going to be going into uh, practice shortly upon graduation. And that's exactly the point. We need that engagement, community interaction, because the solution to the answer to that is going to come collectively from all of us, from those students, from our leaders in the community, from the governing agency, uh, you know, policy uh, site uh, individuals uh, to, you know, financing mechanisms that are in um, that might be in place uh, to support some of these initiatives. So this is again a collaborative effort. So in response to that cost issue, and especially looking at what's happening in North Bay Village in one residential community with so many varying 
conditions along one street, one house being significantly different than the house next door and the one after that. So we said, how can we bring some of these innovative approaches and multifunctionality to existing structures? And can we do it in a more economical way? Uh, so with like patches or modular elements. So we are investigating, for example, uh, what you see on the screen as a cap that has a double site. One site is again land and um, site for uh, nutrient filtration and um, and the water site being for uh, you know uh, the marine aquatic life uh, being promoted, whether it's seagrass beds or mangroves. So that's uh, you know one example there. Uh, so these are early concepts uh, that we're experimenting with and hopefully they'll uh, become uh, more exciting and further develop as we move along. So this is simply adding a, just a cap, but the, the, you know, the key there is making it modular and um, extendable, uh, almost like Lego blocks uh, in that sense. Um, and then the next one again is uh, even for walls that may be there, they may not be tall enough and they may also not be structurally uh, in good shape. They may have cracks, they may not be stable uh, where you know, a new layer of seawall could be added on top uh, in front, either on land side or bay side uh, to stabilize that wall. And uh, again, you know, one of the innovative solutions, the sea hive element that I mentioned at the very beginning could become that solution as, as a vertical installation in that setting, uh, for example. Um, so uh, modular panels, 3D printed panels, all of these are uh, solutions that again, uh, we can integrate and we can integrate it in increments as perhaps more cost-effective solutions moving forward. So uh, finally, like few things I want to mention. So while some of these seem, may seem like they're far-fetched and really far away, uh, we're, it is exciting to note that, for example, fiber polymer reinforced seawall construction has been adopted as an option in the zoning code in North Bay, Bay Village. So, um, you know, my colleagues uh, who develop uh, these design details in collaboration with industry partners um, actually deliver this and it was adapted by North Bay Village. So it is possible. So we are slowly making a, a difference, uh, you know, in, along these lines. As, as the next one, um, you know, um, we did build a fiber uh, polymer reinforced uh, seawall cap, a 50 foot section in North Bay Village. Uh, at the Treasures on the Bay uh, Condominium Association property. Um, so it's a 50 foot section. It's a, almost like a, a pilot prototype project. Um, everything you see there, all the reinforcement is fiber polymer. Uh, so non-corrosive elements. So um, that's what we want to see again. Uh, you can visit that site. It is beautiful. It's there today. So as the next step, um, you know, so uh, what we're uh, looking to do at the same site, we're going to be installing this sea hive, which again, uh, I briefly mentioned. And I know like a month or two ago, I think my colleague, Dr. Landov Barberigos gave a presentation in more depth about sea hives. Um, he is the primary leading uh, uh, colleague uh, on, on that front, on that project, on the sea hive. So, we are actually currently in permit application stage where we're gonna be deploying Sea Hive installation as a riprap alternative in North Bay Village in an eight foot section of the wall. Um, so it's again, exciting that we are actually seeing uh, this happening. And then we have another one again that, um, you know, my colleague, I, I don't know if uh, he's still online, he could, Certainly jump in, but he briefly talked about this in the past. This is a Wahoo Bay installation, which we're currently in design stage. 
that will incorporate the sea hives along with uh, mangrove plantations. And this will be in partnership with City of Pampano Beach and uh, Shipwreck Foundation in a recreational uh, park setting uh, for K through 12 plus uh, college research teams, our PhD students will be engaged in this um, as a park site during the installation and then beyond installation monitoring uh, biodiversity and marine life growth through uh, the, the sea hive elements, which are perforated structural modules and, and then the growth of the mangrove plantations there. So that wraps it up for me. So I hope I didn't run too long and gave you a pretty broad perspective on what we have been up to and uh, love to hear your comments or questions. Thanks, uh, thanks, Esper. That was uh, really interesting and exciting to see some of these ideas really taking shape in, uh, in the actual actual world and water and where we live, where the you know, make, making a difference directly. Uh, anybody have any other any questions for us? I, I know one of the. Oh, I know, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I know we're running honestly late uh it's 8 16 and we have two other presentations but i don't think we can get it i don't think we should get into a whole conversation about it but I, I i have an almost philosophical uh uh perspective and that is um just like skyscrapers signal to folks that you know we have a bright future moving ahead of us um these very um um mission driven uh, solutions to helping the people here today, right? Like clearly this is what it's about and they're in incredibly valuable because they try to do some uh, biomimicry. They try to do some, um, you know, uh, restoration, but they, they may send, they may send, uh, and, and I, I sound like a total pessimist, so please forgive me, but they may send signals that um, all is good and we can solve this. And as hopeful as I wanna be about that, I know that Miami has an expiration date and the amount of resources that would be required to, um, help to sort of hold back what humans have done to our climate, that's cooked. That's cooked right now. There's nothing we can do to undo it. Uh, may be better spent in, um, in a graceful retreat and with humility and understanding that, that there needs to be another approach and that instead of building a broken seawall, it's about letting that property that has a seawall um, become a part of a new ecosystem that will help, help buffer the street beyond that. And little by little, just step away. I know that's pessimistic as all hell, but knowing what the future brings, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, I'm, I'm wondering that. And I, I don't, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time thinking or talking about that because it's 818 and we have two other presentations, but I just wanted to put that there. And then obviously Esber and anyone can answer, but I just, I just wanted to put that there, just a, a certain amount of humility as to where we're going. And of course that defeats the whole purpose. That's, that's the pain that's, and everything else, you know? <laughs> but, that's a valid point, Xavier. I, and I think I, I'm gonna go back again and say the key response to that is gonna be in educating our community and uh, you know, bringing some factual awareness uh, to the folks in the community uh, ranging from financial resources that are necessary to limitations of application of these innovative solutions from policy perspective to, uh, you know, who can benefit from them and who will have access to them. Um, so, but, so, but this will require across the board interaction with community members in all age groups and you know demographics and uh, to make that difference uh, you know otherwise it gets diluted and um, so 
that message was lost. And the second footnote I have is when we dredged the uh, Port Everglades uh, to bring the big ships through the Panama Canal, we unleashed all sorts of environmental havoc on our bay. That's stuff that we're still uh, trying to deal with now. And um, as we try to build, you know, solutions, right? Um, you know, just walk, you know, our bay is literally gasping for its last breath. It's literally uh, in trouble because again, what you're trying to solve, what you're trying to fix so that the nutrients don't go in the bay. Um, sometimes when a patient is really sick, you don't do surgery, you know, you just try to keep that. And I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, messing with our seagrasses and doing all these kind of solutions at a time when the bay is really about to have a regime change into uh, an algal uh, uh, as opposed to, you know, seagrass uh, reality. I'm just, again, I, I sound pessimistic and conservative. I'm just, uh, I'm just worried about these futuristic ideas instead of walking humbly and, and trying to do things like getting our sewers taken care of, uh, putting extreme restrictions on the kind of fertilizers and pollutants that we use. I, I don't know, there's a part of me that, um, you know, wants to, um, you know, to take a step back, but that's just me. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, Brian, open, you know, uh, those are just my two little comments there, but uh, feel free to, well, I mean, I guess the decision to retreat and the decision to stay is usually not based on how clever the design is. And I think if we are going, if people are going to be willing to invest, we ought to encourage them to do the most <laughs> things that are the best and most resilient solutions and have the least impact on their neighbors and other people and maybe have positive impact. So I guess that's. I mean, I understand where you're coming from on that, but I think the decision is made well below before. To me, the decision is made well before we get to that point. I mean, we have to encourage these things if they're going to, people are going to invest in staying where they're at. At some point, of course, some of the, some of the properties are not going to be worth saving, right? Whatever that means, whatever by worth by, you know, they're, they're too risky to to continue to insure and all that. Anyway, I, I mean, we still have still still out in the bay. I mean, so so at some point, the uh, okay. I, I think we should move on. Thank you very much, Esther. Unless somebody else has any question for him right now. Um, and I guess Adam, thank right. you very much for your talk. It's thank a you. Uh, I wanted to make a comment about like the seawall. Um, yeah. Like I like I personally, I'm not very super. Sometimes I wonder if it's better to relocate in the long run than to build a seawall because, like, it depends on the building code if they're predicting on the worst case scenario because we don't really know exactly what's going to happen in the future. And we could just end up making a seawall that just can't handle the loads that we're not anticipating. So I wonder if it's going to become like a maladaptation. Well, hopefully not. So the whole idea of the investigation that we are looking at is, um, you know, to make sure that we have an understanding of, based on the projections, what is the type of seawall that we need to construct that will be resilient and it will uh, you know serve its function um, you know as costly as this exercise is something else that's important to mention is that there are certain areas that require a significantly more you know uh, defenses and other areas that could be fine with less Today, our codes and policies that are in place um, treat all as one, all the same. And so that could, uh, having that understanding could make additional financial resources available to put in the right place and not just continue building, for example, these fortified walls where it's not gonna make a difference there, but it, you know, we could be doing something else there. Uh, so 
again, this is a very big problem, very big uh, question with lots of moving parts. And we are kind of inching away in, in our attempts, but you know, hopefully we will uh, get there one uh, step at a time. The biggest um, you know, comment really, Xavier, in my mind is, as the Miami-Dade County came out with the sea level rise project, um, uh, mitigation efforts and uh, the plans, at the same time, we are hearing all the anticipated growth in Miami and the tech companies moving to Miami. So it's very much like, um, you know, we're on two opposite ends of that spectrum uh, of retreat or uh, build defenses and economic dr you know, drivers are the really the deciding um, uh, entities almost uh, on which way we proceed. This is, this is interesting uh, for me, it is, and my colleagues and my team, for example, we do have uh, some of us who feel the same as you do, and some of us who are totally on the other side, feeling that, you know, the economic impact uh, and, and value is, is just does not warrant retreat. And so this is an ongoing debate we all exchange in and hopefully will produce some fruitful outcomes uh, that will be beneficial for these discussions. Well, thank you very much again uh, for this opportunity and um, look forward to uh, staying engaged. And I will share the invite for my students' presentation just to get that perspective uh, also from them. Uh, more than welcome to join us then late April, early May. Thanks so much, Esper. Thank so you. Brian, I think we're gonna move on with just having Adam make a, an, an announcement and having Jamal, right? Yep, so I can go ahead and the announcement super quick and then I'll just give it to Jamal. So we can have probably just like five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever Jamal wants um, for that. So the announcement that I have comes from a UM professor and climate scientist that some of you uh, know, Dr. Catherine Mack. She made us aware of an opportunity uh, with one of her colleagues over at Mercer University, uh, whose name is Jen Barkin, and she's recruiting people who have quote, experiences with climate change to participate in a focus group in mid-May. Um, experiences can be living in South Florida and having an existential dread of sea level rise and climate change, uh, I assume, but uh, you, will, you will get $40 if you'd like to participate. So if you want to, I'm gonna drop her link in the chat, uh, by her link, I mean, and I'm sorry for all these dingings, um, her email in the chat, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, so this is her email, and uh, if you guys would like to participate, it's forty dollars, and um, and that's it. That's all the information we got. So there's that, and I'll hand it over to Jamal now. If you have any questions about that, feel free to throw them in the chat. Hi. Good evening. Um, I will keep it brief, but um, at at the end, I'm, I'm really hoping to get some feedback from uh, the attendees tonight. Um, so I'd like to present to you what we've been talking about with regards to the resources section of the Underwater HOA website. And um, if I can share screen. Okay. Can you? Uh... Yeah, we can see. You see, okay. So on the left, you have the, the current resources section. And the idea is to kind of embrace the participatory art aspect of the underwater HOA project and have the resources section be a tool of not just information, but of communication and community. And so what we're hoping for is that each of the components of the resources section, they spark a dialogue, um, they feed interest 
and ultimately it gets people talking and participating in the momentum that is increasing every single day with every report, with every, um, you know, extreme climate change event, people are talking. Um, that's evident in what is happening with Miami-Dade County's latest news about their strategies. And so uh, first, the AE, one of the components is going to be sea level elevation map, where we're gonna focus on libraries, schools, and local city, um, city halls. And you'll be able to see the elevations of each of those places. And these are, you know, these are community focal points. These are places where people, people go, they, they learn, they, they, you know, these, these are, these are like cultural centers. Um, they are political centers and what happens to these places will have a domino effect for the larger areas. Uh, second, we'll have climate news. Um, there will be a keyword driven news section where the news items will be populated based on specific keywords that are uh, that pertain to the local South Florida community. Well, if I can interrupt, would you mind um, just showing the right side of your screen a little bit bigger so we can read what's there? Because right now, it's oh sure. Small. Maybe just zoom in. Yeah, thanks. Okay. And then three will be hurricane prep, but focused on how neighbors can help each other, not necessarily just links of places to go for, you know, shutters or or evacuation routes. These are going to be ideas to bring people together. And then ultimately four, we have the guest speaker section where you'll be able to go and see all of the uh, guest speakers that we've had present to uh, underwater HOA monthly meetings, which is actually up now, but it'll be a component of a new resources section. And so I'd like to just ask tonight's attendees you know, which of these sections speaks to you? And if there's anything that you can think of that you'd rather see that would help you engage with, you know, your friends, your neighbors, your family, and other underwater HOA members. I have a question if nobody else wants to say anything uh, first, which is just at the around the web, it's a, uh, the around the web banner where it says here are local organizations and resources to keep you informed, colon. Is that just like a banner for the rest of it or is that a clickable button that is its own thing? It's a clickable button that will refer to and build on the links that are currently here. Got you, okay. And then in terms of organization, I don't, do we have organizations there? We have. I guess yeah. I there's um, Southeast Florida Climate Compact. There's Miami County Office of Resilience. Um, climate Migration is a really, really good one. And so these links have been up for quite some time. So I'm hoping to add new ones. Gotcha. I guess when I was, when I read local organizations, I'm thinking of like the the Clio's, the like Anne's Extinction Rebellion, or you know the um, Sunrise Movement, like the local climate organizations, um, which could also be an idea to include. But definitely going up. All right, um, can I take the silence as a. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add one, agreement? <laughs> yeah, I'll add one little thing here. I think hurricane prep is important because there's a sense of urgency, but it, it doesn't um, uh, focus on the, on the on the long. In fact, the, the problem is that everyone focuses on the immediate threat and not the slow uh, moving uh, invisible one. So I think that uh, hurricane prep should, should go there, but it probably shouldn't have spot number three. I think that, um, preparing for sea level rise would, would work there. And just things like flood insurance and um, uh, 
um, you know, adaptation, um, uh, things like that. You know, just questions about what neighbors can do today uh, property values, tax base, those kind of things. Again, those are harder to prep for. That's the whole reason we have this organization. But I think that that's probably a, a more relevant connection. Um, and I also think that uh, the app, the Eyes on the Rise app is an incredible resource. And although we use it as part of how to participate, I think it should be featured heavily, you know, sort of on, on this page. Um, okay. And, and the, the top, that top, just from a design point of view, that top bar almost looks like a header as opposed to where a lot of valuable resources are. So I would I would look at design on how you would handle that because I, I wouldn't want folks not to go to climate migration or to our office of resilience. Uh, you know, so I think those those matter as well. So you know, I think you tweak okay. it around. But I love what you're doing, and um, and yeah, uh, design matters a lot in in, in just sort of yeah. the user experience and how they're going to move through it. But um, I also think that the visualizations that uh, that you're going to create, or I hope that you will be creating, may be attractive too, so that those may be those may come to the page. But um, the important part is what you're doing here is that you're you're having people understand the topography and therefore the threat. You are uh, making them aware of places where they can go to find out news, like the one I just told. I started us today with uh, the Gulf Stream and the Arctic. Uh, I do think there needs to be, you know, a, um, a way of prepping for the future, right? Like planning for a future with sea level rise. And I think that, that that's probably a more exciting toolbox for folks, including future hurricanes. And, um, and then of course the uh, lectures like, you know, Esper's today and all the lectures we have, clearly an incredible resource for us too. So yeah, I think these work and, and, and this shouldn't be there should be other opportunities. Like Adam said, you know, you can add other locals. There might be some nice TED talks or other conversations, you know, there's stuff like that too. But for now, I, I do think it's a really good. To, you know, to one, one thing I'm going to suggest quickly there as, as another topic is zoning ordinances. There are mm -hmm. significant changes in zoning ordinances in all of our communities. And some of those are being added uh, with, in, with incentives. Uh, so incentivizing the community stakeholders um, through zoning ordinances and having understanding and exposure to some of those could very much uh, be uh, something that in that uh, preparing for future Xavier that you mentioned, for example, the yep. toolbox, in that category, category uh, could be, you know, very re useful resource to have. Yeah, Esper, I know that they're not, just so you know, I, I just I feel a little bit, uh, I was a little strong worded. Clearly we're not gonna destroy Brickle and make Brickle a mangrove forest. And there are lots of properties that we have no control over that are worth millions of dollars. It doesn't make sense to uh, eminent domain those properties and make them into, um, into wetlands um, when, there's an easier strategy that even the homeowner would want. So yeah, policy is about trying to, um, you know, be reasonable and about compromise, no doubt about that. And you know what, people love their sea views. That's why they have a house on the water so they can see the water. So I get all those things. What I'm trying to do um, is just bring to that entire calculus, just a little, a little humility, because of course, if you're looking at a bay that looks like green pea soup, you're not gonna have a job, you're gonna have to wear a mask, everything's gonna be dead and tourism is gonna collapse. So, you know, it's about how do you balance all these approaches? But yeah, that Miami is gonna continue growing and building and we better, as Brian said, do it right than go with the same old methods, yeah. of course. But I just want, you know, the same way I don't want us to look at skyscrapers and think Miami is eternal. <laughs> I don't want us to look at technological solutions and thinking our bay will survive and survive and survive without helping it but I wanted uh, you know personally thank you for being here and for taking so much time to prepare the presentation to share it with us so thank you very much well, my pleasure thank you hey okay, does any uh, before we end Brian do you have any any comments or anything uh, uh, or anyone I mean I had nothing thanks everybody for uh, a really uh, enjoyable discussion Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming.
for tuning in tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jamal, for showing that. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jamal. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Bye. Bye. See you. Bye, guys.